Today I have uh, Darren Batchelder, who is uh, hailing from the Dallas area. He has done one deal recently in the multifamily space and glad to have him on the show. Darren, thank you very much. How's it going today? Very good. Mason, I appreciate you having me on. Looking forward to it. Perfect. Well, let's uh, just get right into the questions then. So obviously everyone's talking about COVID-19, the impact on collections, rent. So how's your property doing so far? Property is doing very good. Um, I have to say that, that I was uh, pretty nervous about it, uh, to be honest with you. So it, we have a 76 unit property it was my it's myself and um, another gentleman that I met through a networking group who lives in Chicago his name is Raj Gupta and the two of us are the general partners the sponsors on the deal and um, you know I always wondered how multifamily was going to be impacted in a downturn and I've had a lot of syndicators educate me that hey Darren multifamily is really resilient in, in a down uh, economy. You have people that are moving out of their homes and then become new renters. They may have to move because they can't afford the mortgage anymore or, um, and there's foreclosures and people move in. In addition to that, you, you have um, renters that may be in A properties that may you know, want to save some money and go down to B properties and, and B renters move down to C properties. We kind of focus in on the, the B, C space. So, you know, it all made sense to me, but I haven't lived through it before. So I was always wondering, okay, well, how is it really going to play out? And when COVID-19 happened, you know, there was no playbook for this, you know? So, all of a sudden the government comes and tells you that for 120 days you're unable to evict any of your tenants if they don't pay. And so that scared the shit out of me. I'm sorry. I, I just didn't know what the impact was going to be for renters. Um, you know, were they going to just sit in the, in that unit and not pay for four months? Um, you know, we, we had large cash reserves, so we, we had a, a bandwidth that we could, you know, run, but I wasn't sure if collections were going to be 30% of the previous month or 50% or 70%. And so April came along and um, collections were slow. And I went out to the property, we knocked on every door, we, we tried to let all the tenants know we wanted to work with them uh, the best we, can, we could. Uh, we, we went looking for other resources um, that may have rent assistance to, to let them know where they can get rent assistance. And uh, rent collections were very slow, but by the end of the month, we actually collected 90% of what we collected the prior month, which blew my mind. I was, I was like, you know, it, it's surpassed my expectations. And then the next thing was everybody said, May is going to be worse than April because, you know, people had some money saved up to pay April rent, but they're probably going to be wiped out for eight, after April and May collections are going to be worse. And, um, you know, uh, kudos to, to our property management company. Uh, we use uh, Wayner Multifamily. They manage over 20,000 units. And I went to them and said, well, you know, what kind of programs can we put, what kind of incentives can we put to, to try to bring, you know, more cash in quicker? And so we implemented a couple programs and um, gave some discounts for early payment of rent. And then we were way ahead in May as compared to April. And um, May is actually turning out to be, uh, we'll have uh, higher collections than we had in April. So now we're two, two months in out of the four months, you know, we still have uh, June and July to get through. But so far, what I'm seeing is that, you know, when it comes to making payments, people tend to pay for the roof over their head, you know, before they make, you know, other, other payments. So, um, so far, so good. Okay. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> that makes sense. Have you had any issues with that moratorium and needing to evict people, a small few? We had um, 
Well, we had three people that were in the eviction process before it happened. So we were we had started the eviction process, uh, three out of 76 units. And um, so I thought for sure those three would just sit tight and not make any payments. And um, but we took a proactive approach. Uh, we went out and and you know met with them. One of them ended up skipping in the night. Um, so just realized they weren't going to make the payments and they just left. Um, that was unfortunate. It you know the the outstanding rent became uncollectible, bad debt. But the, the plus of that was that we were able to re-rent that unit. Um, it, you know, that tenant didn't sit there for four months not paying. Another tenant was um, pretty far behind on their, on their rent. And we went to them and, and um, talked to them about doing a, a payment plan. And they agreed to do a payment plan. And so far, they've been um, making the payments on that payment plan. So we have somebody that you know, instead of just sitting there and not making any payments it is actually trying to, you know, get caught up. And so we're, we worked something that works for both parties. And then the third uh, one kind of gave up promises that they were, they were just waiting for the, the stimulus check to show up and then we were going to be first to be paid. And, and that one skipped out in the night also. And, um, but we re 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 rented that unit, so we ended up. Uh, it was a little scary, kind of mid month. Uh, we were we had like nine units that were available, and um, in the month of May, our on site leasing manager, she's awesome, and she leased up all nine units um, this month. And and actually, we've owned the property for about a year and a half, and this month in May is the first month that we are 100% occupied right now, which is, is crazy in the middle of this crisis. And, and what that tells me is that, you know, there is demand, you know, outside of, you know, if, if somebody leaves, we have more demand coming in that has interest in these BC apartments. The other thing that um, I think we're going to find in, in the Dallas market is that, you know, I keep hearing from people that are on the on both coasts. You know, um, California and New York. You know, they've been paying exorbitant rent, or if they own property, you know, it's extremely expensive. And now that people are working from home, there's more and more people that are starting to think, well, why don't we move to, you know, to Texas or to Arizona or to Florida or the Carolinas? So I I believe that you know, over time that, you know, Dallas is just going to keep seeing an influx of new people coming into the state. And, um, you know, that's good for BC apartments. Okay. That does remind me of something else that I've been concerned about is, do you feel like, I've heard that multifamily has really just gone into to Vogue recently and it's just more and more people doing it. So do you feel like it's ever going to reach a point or maybe it already has where there's just too much capital chasing too few deals? That's a great question. And I, I think that that um, time will tell on that one. So we're kind of in the middle of this and we closed on that deal kind of ended 2018. And in the last year I've been chasing other, you know, it's my second deal and have been runner up on three deals um, it's extremely competitive in the Dallas market. And with this COVID-19 crisis, you know, things kind of got put on pause. The deals that were in contract, most, you know, most of those either found a way to get renegotiated and close or people lost their, their earnest money and the deal fell apart. Um, there hasn't been a ton of new deals that have come out to the market. There's, there's kind of this wait and see attitude. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I think that if it, it kind of, de it depends on the economy. I mean, if Texas economy comes back and it's like nothing happened, then there's people are going to have the money and the jobs and the income. And I think they'll, they'll continue to be a strong um, capital base to invest in multifamily. Um, 
Now, if we get to the end of right now, unemployment insurance is, is through the end of July, the extended uh, federal unemployment. Well, if we get past that point and people really start feeling the pinch, then, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens to occupancy. And if, you know, if rents actually go, you know, ha- if there's more specials and if there, you know, concessions and actually rents go down versus increasing every year, um, then that would impact cash flow. And then I think people would start having a second thought. I don't know the answer. Um, my gut feel is that it's, it's early right now and real estate tends to lag the, the economy. And so, you know, I think that the deals are going to, are going to come from, you know, deals that people that bought two, three years ago with bridge loans and those, those bridge loans are coming due. And then all of a sudden they, they realize that the lender is not going to extend those loans. Well, you know, that owner has to do something right. And at that point, um, you know, some of the, some or all of the equity may get wiped out, you know, a new buyer may come in and take on the loan. And that way the sponsors don't have their, you know, their credit hurt or, um, you know, cause if they let it go to, to foreclosure, then not only does everybody get their equity wiped out, but the sponsors who put together the deal, you know, will have a huge black mark and, and they won't be able to get financing going forward. So I don't know. It, it kind of all depends on the shape of the, the rebound. Everybody has these debates on whether it's a V, a W, a swoosh. You know, I, I don't know the answer. My gut feel tells me, man, 30 million plus people unemployed. I don't see how we just shoot back up. You know, I just don't see how that happens. But, you know, I, I could be wrong. I talked to a lot of people in different corporations, like C-level executives that are on conference calls with divisions all over the, all over the world. And most of those companies, you know, the, when I talk to people on the golf course or wherever, um, they're like, Darren, man, this is going to take two or three years. And, and of all the people that we furloughed, you know, we're probably not going to take a hundred percent of those employees back. You know, we're probably going to use that time to weed out the bottom 20 or 30%. Well, if you're talking 30 plus million people, that's 6 million people unemployed, you know, that weren't unemployed before. So I, I think there has to be some kind of impact, but I'm happy that I'm in multifamily and I'm not in retail or office, you know, or hospitality. I mean, imagine owning hotels at at this stage of the game, you know, it's very, 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 very difficult. Yeah. Something interesting that I heard Grant Cardone say on a webinar, maybe a week or so ago was he expects to see a lot of these types of properties converting to multifamily because there's just like for one, one example, he saw a development deal where the developer spent many years, creating this, um, I forget if it was a, a shopping mall or a hotel or something, and eventually decided that it's just better off converting to multifamily because it's just a better investment and just it, more demand for that. You know? it, that very well, you know, that, that could be, um, you know, I think it depends on the property and, you know, the, uh, the cost to convert it, you know, and whether, you know, it's, and the cost of acquisition, you know, so, there's, there's a lot of factors that, that play into that. I remember when I was living in, in South Florida, the opposite was happening, right? There were real estate was during 2002 to 2006, real estate was just taking off and, um, you know, it was going up 15, 20% a year and incomes are only going up three or 4%. Eventually something's going to, you know, have to give way. And a, a lot of multifamily properties were starting to be converted to condo conversions, right? So, Hey, instead of just renting these units, let's, let's, you know, convert them to condos and then sell them for big profit. Um, and if you were able to get through all the sales, you know, before the market turned, you did very well, but there were a lot of developments that were 20% sold. And then all of a sudden the market turned and they were stuck. And then they had to kind of go back to, all right, 20% of the units are, are condos and the other 80% we're going to go back to regular multifamily. So, 
you know, time will tell for sure. Okay. Have you personally considered investing in other asset classes like storage facilities or mobile home parts? Like so considered, um, yeah, the thought has crossed my mind. Um, but my background, I've been trading loan portfolios, uh, bank to bank for since like 2002. And the focus has been residential, multifamily and commercial real estate loans. And, and I've always really liked multifamily because people need to live somewhere. And, um, and I like the story behind BC multifamily because, you know, even in the Dallas market, Dallas has had a ton of growth in population and in jobs and also in new construction multifamily. But the new construction multifamily has all been in the A segment, okay? So the higher income um, segment and what we focus in on is BC. Um, so 1960s, 70s, 80s kind of construction. They're not, there's no new properties that are being built, you know, that compete with that. So I like that there's, um, you know, more people moving in to the area and they're not building any new competing properties. You still have to compete against other BC properties um, that people continue to upgrade and, and, you know, improve on, but you're not competing really against the A properties because those properties are, are priced so much higher. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I did hear one person saying that their strategy had shifted from the BC properties to A minus because they were going to pay a similar cap rate. So if you know, you could get something that was built in the '90s or early 2000s, you have know, less right. maintenance. Right. I, I've I've seen I've seen syndicators that have shifted in the last couple of years. They used to do B, C, and then they they kind of shifted more to B plus A minus. And um, you know, I think that if they if they're able to get in and you know do their business plan in t in time, you know, before COVID happened, then they're probably all right. The properties I think are going to be in, have a difficult time are if the COVID situation really, really negatively impacts the economy with job loss and people looking for jobs and people running out of money. I think that the, the, the new developments that are in the lease up st stage are going to have a hard time filling that property um, at the rents that they had in their business plan. You know, so in order to attract those people, they're probably going to have to give concessions. And if they're giving large concessions, then they're not getting the returns to their investors that they had projected when they put the deal together. Yeah, that makes sense. Any, any pitfalls like that could happen. Um, that actually reminds me though, what kind of pitfalls do you think a, uh, new person should be aware of, especially before doing your first deal? Like what is, what are some you've encountered and others? <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot, there's a lot of pitfalls. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I guess you, you didn't ask about advice, but you know, if you're, if you're thinking about uh, being a first time investor in large scale multifamily, and I would define large scale multifamily as 60 units or, or greater because um, at that level, you could typically, afford to have a full-time leasing person on site and a full-time maintenance person on site. If you buy a 12 unit or 20 unit property, um, you could still do very well, but most likely it's going to be a part-time thing. You're going to have a manager that's managing your property and also two or three other properties. And if somebody wants to look at a unit, they have to call and make an appointment versus just stop and buy that sort of thing. I, I like having full-time staff on, on the property. Um, but in order to get in that game, I believe, 100% believe that you have to partner with somebody that's already done it. You know, I, for a number of different reasons. One, because there are pitfalls, right? And the person that's already purchased two, three, four properties is going to help coach you along the way and help you not make those rookie mistakes um, that could really negatively impact not only you, but, you know, your investors returns. Um, secondly, you're, you're most likely not going to win a deal if you're in that big space um, because on almost every deal, there's 15 offers 
you know, six or seven go into, into best and final. And then there's three or four that, you know, the, the price and terms are pretty close. And then the seller and the, and the broker sit down together and the, and the seller says, who should I go with? And the broker, you know, is not going to pick the new guy. He's not going to pick the new guy by himself because the broker one wants to get paid. He want he wants his commission. He only gets his commission if, if the deal closes. And two, he doesn't want egg on his face with the seller. He wants to perform. So he's going to pick a buying group that he knows can raise the capital, can get the financing, and who's good to their word and will and will close. So unless you way overpay. Okay. That's, that's another way you could get, get it is, is way over pay for the deal. Then you might get it as a new person. Um, but if, if you're in the ballpark of everybody else, uh, you really need to have an experienced partner. Okay. And ultimately if you're the person that plays golf with the broker, then maybe they'll <laughs> fish that, your that helps in. too. Um, that helps too, for sure. But I've, I talked to people that, are really good friends with a broker and don't have any deals under their belt. And hmm. I'm pretty candid with them that in the large multifamily space, even if they're good buddies with them, if they're trying to do it alone, the broker still has a big commission and big reputation on the line. He's most likely not going to throw that deal to you. He's going to go with the, the surest bet. And if he knows this other person has a track record. Although. Yeah. The, another, you know, another buying group has, you know, they've closed on 10 deals for, you know, 1200 units. They've, you know, they've personally done two deals with them. You know, um, that's a much sure bet. And, um, you know, they, they're in business. They're in business to make money and they're in business, you know, to satisfy the, the invest. I mean, they're, uh, their client who is the seller, you know, so they're trying to get them top dollar and make sure that they're bringing a qualified buyer to the table. Okay. I know it's important to build a power team. So the broker is obviously part of your power team and having a more experienced investor, but um, can, can you help me understand kind of the sequence of events in terms of, should I just go out looking for deals right now on my own just to get, more familiar with what's out there or should I build all of my power team, the experienced investor, the broker, everyone, the property manager first, and then start attacking deals or what do you, how did you approach it? So, well, those are two different questions, what you should do and what I, what I did. Right. Um, you know, you have, for you, you have to determine what, what your goal is. Like, are you looking to buy a duplex, a fourplex? Are you looking to buy an 80 unit, you know, apartment community? Though, you know, the, the steps that are involved and are different, you know, based on what your goal is. Uh, so for me, I um, I've, had always wanted to get in the real estate side, but I spent a lot of time building up my business and um, never did want to do single family fix and flips. So I wanted to go bigger. I did go buy a new construction duplex and um, that was October of 2018. And I don't regret that because it, it, it was like the step that got me in the game. So I signed that contract and now I was like, you know, okay, I want to grow this thing and I'm not going to make a ton of money off this duplex. And it's going to take me forever if I go duplex, fourplex, eightplex. So how can I go bigger? So it started to get me looking for a way to go bigger. And then for me, I actually found a, a multifamily mentorship group uh, based in the Dallas area here. I think you mentioned early on, you know, so I'm part of the Brad Sumrock group. Um, that's where I met a lot of other syndicators um, that I was able to really pick their brain. How'd you do it? You know, what were the, you know, what were the challenges? How'd you overcome those challenges? You know, who, who do you use for property management? Who do you use for attorneys? Who do you use for rehab? Um, who do you use for financing? All those, all those questions. And so then I started to hear a lot of people using the same kind of two or three, you know, partners. And, and so I started to try to develop relationships with those, those people because, 
you know, those partners now have skin in the game, not just with me, but with the entire network. So, you know, I liked that, that concept, but it was kind of proven that they've done well for other people. In addition, it was a network where I was able to meet a lot of passive investors, you know, uh, people that they didn't necessarily want to be the front person going and finding the deal. Um, but, you know, they had capital that, they had that they wanted to invest in large scale multifamily and they wanted to invest with people that they know and they like and they trust. And um, so the group gave us an opportunity to have networking events where we got to sit down and talk to each other and get to know each other. And, you know, some people are like, Hey, I want to do business with you. And, you know, I wouldn't have met them had it not been for, for that network. Okay. But um, besides going to that network and really connecting with those passive investors, what are some other ways you feel like it's good to build out that investor database? That's really crucial. Yeah. So people ask me and people contact me on Instagram and ask me, you know, how, do, how do I get started? I'm, I'm like, if you have the capital, I think it's a, it's a great way to really um, kickstart your, your relationship, um, database both on the syndication side and also on the on the is to join one of these groups but that's not so i have some people that say hey darren i just don't have the capital to do that you know how do i do it if i don't do that and then then my answer is okay well you, get, you need to start going to these meetup groups there's free meetup groups and in, in most major markets um just download the the app on your phone it's meetup m-e-e-t-u-p and then just in the search field, just put apartment investing or multifamily investing, and you'll find meetup groups that are in your area. Um, go to those meetup groups and they're free. And when you go there, meet as many people as you can. And there, there might be 20, 30, 40, 50 people there. And some of them are syndicators and some of them are passive investors. And you want to meet both. But the syndicators, you want to let the syndicators know hey, look, I'm, you know, I'm interested in passive investing, okay? Even if you don't have a ton of capital to invest, you want to exchange business cards, you want to get on their investor database. And, and the reason is because when they have a deal, now they'll reach out and include you in the, in the communications if they think that you're interested. And then they'll have a webinar that talks about, all right, here's the deal, Here's the minimum investment requirements. Here are the forecasted returns. Well, register for that webinar, even if you're not going to invest in that deal. Okay. It's a learning mechanism. It's a learning mechanism from a, diff a number of different factors. One, if you've never invested in a, in a syndication before, um, it, you know, it helps you learn how, how they uh, present it and what the returns are and what the expectations are. And, and, um, you know, what the timeline is that your money is going to be out, out there, what kind of the exit strategies are. Um, but in addition to that, you mentioned you want to start, you know, actively investing. Well, if you look at three or four or five of these presentations, you start to build some things that you like that this person did and some things he, he didn't, he or she didn't do that you would do differently. And then so you start forming your own opinion on, hey, I would have changed up that presentation this way, or I would have presented it this in this manner. Um, and that starts forming the basis on your business and how you're going to um, raise capital from, from in individual investors. So I would go to these meetup groups. I would also go to, there's a lot of uh, weekend multifamily seminars um, and they're very affordable because, you know, the people that are putting on these seminars are trying to attract people there at a low dollar price so that they can get them to sign up for their program, which is, you know, much more expensive at the end of the weekend. Well, you don't have to sign up, but when you go on that weekend, you know, you're going to meet a lot of other people. And that's the key. I think that, look, if you want to get into this business, you have to surround yourself with other like-minded people, okay? Other people that have done what you want to do 
And um, for, for a few reasons, one, you want to leverage the experience of others, you know, and, and avoid the pitfalls that other people went through. And then also just from a mindset perspective, you know, if you're surrounded by coworkers and family and friends that haven't done what you're trying to do, they're going to tell you you're crazy and that you don't have what it takes and that you, you know, who's going to invest with you. You've never done this before. And then all of a sudden when you surround yourself with a ton of people that are like, look, two years ago, I had no deals either. Right. I was in your, I was in your shoes where you are now. I was there two years ago. Well, how did I do it? I did it because I partnered with somebody that did have experience. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. So once the, the broker tells you that you're the winning bid and you need to reach out to your investor database, I believe you have a, a couple months there. To, how long does that usually take to secure that financing, both on the equity and the debt side? So uh, most deals were structured. I'm going to talk pre-COVID because, you know, in, in COVID, there may be more uh, leeway. I don't... Um, but pre-COVID, the deals were structured where you'd have hard money day one, okay? So you sign the contract. So the, the broker tells you, hey, you're awarded the deal, and then maybe it takes you a week to negotiate the purchase and sale agreement uh, back and forth between you and the seller. And then once the contract is signed, you've got 24 hours to wire the, um, the earnest money. And it's, and it's hard, hard earnest money, meaning, um, you know, if you decide not to, to do the deal or if you don't get the financing or you can't raise the capital, you lose that money. Uh, really, the only exceptions are if the seller can't provide good title or if there's environmental issues. Other than that, that money is, is hard day one. Um, the contract typically is a 60-day contract and then uh, very frequently the, the contract will um, include two or three 15-day extensions um, and you know so if, if you if for some reason the financing is taking a little bit longer to get approved you sign you you end up you know extending by 15 days to try to um, get the deal closed so in that 60 days now you set up um, a webinar, maybe a week or two in, okay, you email your investor database, hey, I'm, I'm under contract on this deal, um, you know, just some high level um, characteristics of the deal. And, you know, in a week and a half, I'm going to have this webinar on this night, you know, mark your calendars. And then when that day comes, you've prepared a, you know, PowerPoint presentation, you have a Zoom call, and people, you know, uh, come on the line and, and you end up, you and your partner present the opportunity to the passive investors. At that point, after that call happens, people start coming back and saying, hey, I'm interested, I'm interested. Then you start sending them all of the, um, the documents for signature, which would be the private placement memorandum, the subscription document, um, the LLC agreement, et cetera. And, um, once they sign all those documents, then you send them the wire information. Uh, they, they call you, confirm wire information over the phone, and then wire the funds. So you want to, you know, the earlier you can get all the funds in the bank, you know, for the down payment, and depending on what type of financing you've received, sometimes the bank will, uh, or the, you know, the agencies, Fannie and Freddie will, Fannie, some. Sometimes on some deals will uh, provide financing for the rehab, you know, up to a certain level. Um, and sometimes they won't, uh, you know, Freddie Mac typically on the small balance deals d does not. So we did a Freddie Mac small balance loan. So we had to raise the money for the down payment, the closing costs, uh, some working capital, but also all of the rehab that we had budgeted for. Okay. And the earnest money as well, if that's hard money, where do you get that from typically? That's, that's you. That's the risk on the person putting together the deal. So, um, yeah, that's, 
me and my partner had to put up that money. And, um, and then, you know, when you're talking to passive investors, the passive investors are like, Hey, Darren, well, if I wire this money in now and what happens if the deal doesn't close, right? What if you don't raise enough capital or you don't get the financing? Well, at that point we we're obligated to send back all the passive, um, investors money. Okay. And then the general partners that put the deal together, that put up the, the hard earnest money out of our own pocket. Um, we would lose that money if we couldn't, put the finish and close the deal. So that's the risk of putting the deal together as the, the general partners. And um, however, when you close, okay, then you get refunded for all the fees that you fronted. Okay. So, you know, you fronted hard earnest money, you fronted uh, the money for the inspection, you, inf you fronted the application for the financing, you fronted the, um, uh, the inspection of the property. And so all those fees, the general partners are paying that out of their pocket, okay, until closing. At closing, they get reimbursed for those fees from, from the LLC. Okay. Once the debt gets financed and everything else. Right. Okay. Huh. Um, I remember hearing you say one time that after you close on the property, a lot of things, a lot of problems could happen. Um, I know, for example, we had discussed, mm -hmm. there's a lot of renovations that you didn't expect, a lot of vacancies, and, and then therefore opportunity to renovate. But what are some other things that could happen after the close that you may not expect? A typical thing that happens is that your, your um, occupancy drops. And I had a lot of syndicators tell me, hey, Darren, I just want to let you know after you close, most likely you're going to have a drop in occupancy. And, you know, I was a little naive. I'm like, oh, I don't think that's going to happen on this deal. And, you know, sure enough, it did. And it happens for a few different reasons. Um, one, the seller knows that they need to keep the property full. Okay. If you're, if you're getting agency financing, the property needs to be 90% plus uh, occupied for the, for the previous 90 days. So the seller knows I'm getting a Freddie Mac agency loan. He knows I need to make sure that this property is, at le you know, at least 90% occupied all the way through this buying period, this purchase and sale period. Um, so what happens? They may become more lenient on, you know, the review of bringing in new tenants. Okay. So they, the tenants, some of the later tenants that they bring in may not have been as qualified. Okay. So they, they may all of a sudden become non-paying you know, non-paying or slow paying tenants that you end up having, to, you know, if they're non-paying, then you have to go through the eviction process. Another thing that happens is, you know, the property that we purchased, you know, the prior owners uh, were California family that owned it for over 10 years and they just didn't sink any more money back into renovations. So the, you know, the property needed an uplift both ex on the exterior and the interior. And we had raised the capital to do that. Well, a lot of tenants know that once you start spending money on a property or once the ownership changes, that most likely rents are going to go up. Okay. Because the new ownership group bought it at a higher basis than the prior ownership group. So, in order to be profitable, they're going to have to raise rents. So some tenants will all of a sudden say, Hey, there's a new sheriff in town. I don't want to pay, you know, pay higher rents. So I'm going to go find another property that is still kind of older and, you know, not as refurbished and, but the rents are lower. Um, so you lose people from that perspective as well. Okay. Makes sense. Um, another thing I was wondering, was given your background with loans, I know certain people do note investing. Has that ever been something you've considered on the more the debt side? 
Yeah, for me, it's not, it hasn't been something that I've wanted to do, even though I was in that space. Um, so I was working for a large uh, multinational worldwide bank, AB and AMRO, they're a Dutch bank. Um, and I, at the time, they were a top 20 worldwide bank back in the 2002 to 2006 timeframe. And when I started my own company in 2007, uh, trading loan portfolios, I had to make a conscious decision. Okay, do, do I focus on trouble debt? You know, um, you know, debt that's in, in trouble, scratch and dent, um, you know, well, what I did, I decided against that because the buying group for that type of debt is not another bank. Okay. So the, the buying group for troubled debt are, is private equity firms. Okay. And my, all of my relationships were with banks that were buying for their portfolio, but they were looking to buy clean credit quality performing loans. And so I had to make a decision. Okay. Well, I, I can go into that space and, and get into the troubled debt and there's larger margins there. Um, but you know, it's not my, it's not where my relationship are my relationships are all with uh with banks and the other thing that i didn't like about that space is that you know when i have two banks that negotiate a deal for for a portfolio one bank to another bank they're just up front and good to their word you know so if i'm gonna buy it at a you know a par or at 101 uh one percent premium they're, the bank that's buying it pays that price, you know. So there's a due diligence period of thirty to sixty days, but they're gonna they're gonna pay for that price. Well, on the private equity side, it doesn't work that way, you know. The private equity side, you know, they, hey, I'll I'll pay sixty cents on the dollar for this, and then it's two days before closing, and they're like, you know, this really isn't worth sixty cents. You know, I d I've done my due diligence and it's really worth, you know, 42 cents. And now the selling bank is like, what am I going to do now? If I, if I don't sell to them, then I have to start this process all over again. And, you know, so it's just, a, I didn't want to be involved with that type of last minute, um, you know, it's just not, yeah, the retrade, the retrade. Okay. Um, so it's just a different business. Right. And you didn't consider going to that private equity side and be the person who tries to retrade it? <laughs> yeah. I, no, it's not, it's not me. I'm, I, I, like, I like doing business with people that are straightforward, you know, and good to their word. And that's who I want to be is, is I want to be somebody that, you know, what I say I'm going to do. And I want to, I want to, work with people like that and just you look there's nothing there's a, there's definitely a need for private equity and those you know those low trades and look if i was an investor with that private equity firm i'm gl i'm glad that they're negotiating because i'm you know their the returns if i'm in in their fund then i'm getting massive returns and i'm i'm excited and i'm reinvesting with them but that's not the type of business that i i like to do okay yeah, it makes sense. So it has to fit your personality and right. be something you can run with for the long term. So. Right, exactly. Okay. Great. Well, I think we've hit almost everything for now, but uh, definitely, again, appreciate you being a part of the show and always glad to have you. Thank you very much. It's been very helpful. Mason, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me, um on Instagram at Batchelder Darren, or you can email me at dbatchelder at tzkproperties.com. Thanks, Mason.